I'm going live on YouTube. Wait. Yeah, we, we are live on Facebook. And we are live on YouTube. Good morning. It's 11 o'clock on the third Sunday of the month, which means it's time for yet another episode of Chai and Why. Still, we are online because uh, our venues aren't open as yet, but we'll try and bring you a little glimpse of the world of science, something connected with TIFR. Now the monsoons are ending and at least in Mumbai today is a nice and sunny day outside and it's time to take a look at uh, what the sun can do for us. Solar energy, that's going to be the topic for today. And uh, to tell us about that is a young faculty member from our Hyderabad campus of TIFR, Pabitra Nayak. And Pabitra is, uh, did his, he came to TIFR uh, Mumbai as a PhD student uh, after finishing his bachelor's and master's at uh, Utkal University. And uh, uh, he, he worked in the area of organic and other semiconducting materials. After he finished, he went to the Weizmann Institute in Israel. From there, he went to Oxford and was working in the area of photovoltaics and came back to India just some a little while ago to set up his lab at TIFR Hyderabad. And Pabitra has been working on some of the most exciting new materials in the area of photovoltaics or the way to convert sunlight to electrical energy. And he's gonna take us on a story of these solar cells today. So uh, without further delay, over to you Pabitra. And uh, uh, just remember before that, the audience who are watching, uh, we can't see you, unfortunately, but we would like to interact with you. And the only way we can do it is by the chat. So please put in your questions and comments. If you're on Zoom, you can use the chat or the Q&A box. If you're on following us on uh, YouTube or Facebook, please enter the comments there and we will take them either during the talk if it's uh, something relevant or we will wait and take them at the end. But uh, please do keep sending us your comments and feedback. Okay, uh, over to you, Pavitra. Uh, thank you, Arnav. It's indeed a great pleasure and privilege for me to speak to our general audience. Uh, uh, the title of uh, today's talk is Let's Move to the Sunny Side. Uh, and we'll towards the end of uh, my talk, uh, I hope that I'll convince you that we all move, need to move to the sunny side. Now, uh, let me start with a very basic story of our uh, our human kind, the history. Now we as a species need the external source of energy to, to our comfort and to, to live a better life. It all started with the discovery of fire and we started to use the other form of energy, our external source of energy for our comfort. Now we evolved as a, uh, as a species and we end up here. Now that time it was uh, not a luxury, it was a necessity. Now, this is a necessity. So we have evolved quite a long distance. And what we do to do the other things, we consume more and more energy. If you look at the amount of uh, energy that we are uh, uh, needing post uh, industrialization, it is becoming really, really high. And this, this number, uh, you know, says in, uh, these numbers are in uh, billion tons of oil equivalent. And by 2040, you can get close to like 20 billion tons oil equivalent. That's huge. And if you look at the carbon emission, uh, dioxide emission, only in 2019, and you see that only in India, this is this is a chart for India, and this last update in 4th of February 2021, see that the metric tons of carbon dioxide that were emitting to the atmosphere. 
Now, while doing so, we are doing a lot of harm. And, and this, this, you can compare these two pictures taken by NASA uh, of the Arctic Sea and how much ice cover you have. Uh, that, that picture is from 1979, and this is from 1920. And what you see is that the area that's been covered by ice is, is going down and down. That clearly indicates that our human activities, mostly our uh, habit of consuming energy from, uh, from fossil fuel or, or uh, that generates a lot of carbon dioxide is creating, creating a lot of problem and you might get into a point of no return. Oh, that's 2020, I think, right? Oh, sorry, that's 20, uh, that's 2020. I, I beg your yeah, pardon. The ice that's has gone down. Yeah, that's 2020, not 1920. I'm sorry, okay. 1920, there was no satellite. So that's, <laughs> I, can, I can confirm that. Thing. So that's not. Nice. So what can you do? I mean, uh, can technology, can science help us? Now I can give you an example, which has happened before. So this is a picture of uh, Fifth Avenue of New York City on, on Easter morning. That's the year 1900. And you see that the road is full of uh, horse pulled cars. And that time people are you know, facing a lot of problem for horse manure. It used to be a big, big problem. 13 years later, you see what has changed because the technology was there in internal combustion engine, cars are on the road and you don't see this thing. So what you need is a very drastic change if the science and technology is on our side. It's possible. It's possible if there is a challenge, we can, uh, handle it uh, if, if, if we can uh, uh, mm, mm, find the right technology to handle do that. Thing. Now, how we can work the solution? We can do as our ancestors do, look at the sky, right? You look at the sky, you'll find an answer. And our answer is in the sky. We have a star next to us, which is providing 2 lakh terawatts of, uh, of power to us. Now you know that how much volts energy demand? It's only 20 terawatt for the year. Now it is 10,000 times more than what you need. If you do a back of the envelope calculation, one hour of sunlight that falls on earth is sufficient for our one year's need. So what do we need to do? We have to capture this free energy that comes from sun. We need to develop the technology to do that thing. How to do that thing? Here the scientists come into play. They say that, okay, what you need is a material that would capture the sunlight, even for a moment. Now, when it captures the sunlight, something happens inside this material. What it does, it has to allow electron to jump from one state to another state. It stays there for some time. And what we need to do is that allow this thing to stay there, the electron to stay there for some time, not call back quickly, but stay there for some time and then guide them to one of these electrodes, like in batteries, then you come from to the external circuit to do the job. So what you need is that you need uh, something that should absorb the, the sunlight. So not every piece of things that absorb the sunlight it can be useful. You need something that absorbs the sunlight and keeps the energy content for some time. And then you have to create a valve so that the electrons are going one direction. Now, how do we do that thing? Here comes the semiconductors. From our high school physics, we know that silicon is a semiconductor. And we can add a, 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 an atom different than silicon to, to the silicon matrix to make it uh, a rich in electron or poor in electron. And that's called the N type silicon. And this is called the P type silicon. And what you need to do is that bring these two types of silicon together. When you do these two together, this, there is a you know, more number of electrons here, there is less number of electrons here. So the electron will start to flow in this direction. When they do that thing, they create one electric field here. And once you have the electric field, if you look at the electrostatic potential difference, the electric field, it has already created a valve here. That means if you create uh, electron, you can think of electron like you know, marbles, uh, and, uh, marble spheres that are only go in this direction because this is a downhill process for this thing. If you create something here, it won't go this direction. So it gives us some sort of directionality to the flow of electron in a semiconductor, right? Now, for, for a solar cell, as we say that it will work like a battery, what do you need? You need voltage and also you need current, right? For the electric power, you need both. You need voltage as well as current. So let's see that how you generate voltage because this all I talk about is the flow of 
electrons as you know that the flow of electron causes the flow of current right that's what that that's what we uh, the convention is that the current flows to the opposite direction of electron flows right so that we have got the current now we have to see that from where do we get the voltage now you can think of now this is a valve here so uh, uh, photon comes from the sun so you can think of sunlight is like packets of energy that's are coming so what it does is like that it kicks one electron and that electron jumps to the uh, upper state now it when it goes to the upper state it can't come back quickly it has to take a ladder to come down so it just slows down the process so and if you come with more and more number of photons what you do is that you create more and more number of electrons here and the electrons will slowly slide down to this direction and it will leave behind a counterpart what you call the hole so if you look at it uh, over a period of time you built up a, a, a lots of electron in this side and that difference create uh, it gives rise to voltage it's the same thing as you know in a battery so you have more electron in one end at a different potential so that thing can come out and and do the external job so this gives the voltage now is there any uh, real world uh, uh, example that we can understand uh, solar cell yes you can think of solar cells are like leaky buckets in a uh, in a rainy day so what you can think of is like that you have a bucket and you have leaks here and that leaks are due to the fundamental physics laws that we can do anything with that thing it has a tap and 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 it's raining so the rain drops you can think of like that the photons that are coming from the sun now what you have to do is that to collect these photons to build up uh, you know uh, the water level inside now you can't build up completely because it's always a leak it will leak out so you will always get little less voltage than you are supposed to get now still you are not doing any work what but then we are in a real world so that means you have some more uh, 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 holes in the bucket so the water leaks out it further goes down now here also we are not doing any work so what you need to do is that you have to now open up the tap if you open up the tap then this thing goes down now then here is the case that you open if you completely open it then everything would go out then you won't build up any any uh, uh, potential there so solar cell research is nothing but finding a right size of bucket and looking for what are the extra leakages there and you need to get rid of those things and we as a scientist we are always looking for a nice bucket and if we find a bucket we look for the extra holes present there and we find our ways to mend those extra holes so that we can have uh the highest voltage possible from a solar cell right and if you look at how it looks like you know so the current voltage curve so this the current voltage curve looks like this so the highest voltage is here uh, that you get that you call the open circuit voltage where you don't get any current out so the power output is zero so it is the maximum number of uh, electrons that you can get from a solar cell but there the voltage is zero so your power to output is uh, zero here so there is in between uh, these two points there is one point what you call the maximum power point and that gives the uh, power out from a solar cell and this is how this this rectangle that i mark here gives rise to the power output of a cell and the efficiency of a cell is given by the how much power you are getting out and how much solar power that you are putting in now the solar power is pa pavitra, different i mean yeah. pavitra uh, sorry to interrupt you but this is a i think a very in, in, very very important diagram for uh, you know today's uh, talk so it's like this is it is it uh, if i think of it in terms of the bucket is hmm. it like if i keep my tap closed right that means there is no current there is yeah. no current so, is, so my yes. bucket will fill till yes. whatever level is allowed by the leaks and that yeah. is like my highest voltage so that, that's the voc right? right so this and is of like of course at the voc if i get the high voltage my current is zero because my tap is closed i'm not opening right. anything right, right. if right. i open right. my tap the if i really open my tap nice and big all the water is going to run out so that's the so, jsc that's here this so part. that is that is when you have maximum current but then your voltage is going to go down right okay so okay so that's is, the analogy the, with the bucket great yeah, great and this is the point where you are thing is the your tap is half open and your your bucket is half full so that's why you maintain some voltage and and then but still you get something out of it so this is the maximum power point where is the what we call the operational voltage for solar cell it depends on the load so the tap opening of the tap is like how much load you are putting 
on the solar cell. Okay. Yeah, uh, great, great. I, this is a very nice analogy. Go ahead. Okay. Now, thanks, Arnab. I, I was uh, about to miss that thing. So good that you have uh, reminded me. I was about to tell that thing. I might have missed it. Uh, <laughs> very well. Thank you. Uh, so. The first solar cells. I mean, this came out uh, when people are trying to develop silicon for other semiconductor technology, and it happened in Bell Lab. And then the initial efficiency was six percent, the damn expensive, but they have made use of that thing because those days Bell system used these solar cells to power their telegraph lines because there is not uh, grid connections to those things, and they sell it like something under the sun. Now, how these solar cells are prepared from silicon? Let's understand how first silicon is prepared. So silicon is prepared from sand. You take sand, silicon oxide. To add to that, you add very pure carbon. Then you reduce silicon oxide to silicon. And then you have a lot of process to make sure that the silicon becomes real pure. Like when this is 9N, it is like nine followed by another 99 point, another seven times nine of the purity level. And that's what you use in electronics grade, like if you are a, if you have integrated circuit or computer chips, that's where you use the silicon there. But for solar cell, the five N silicon is good. Now, what you get is like that the five N silicon, you put that in a furnace, you melt it, and then you grow from that thing as single crystal. And that's called the ingot. And then you have to saw it, and then you get something like a, a cuboid type uh, stuff, which is called the square ingot. And then you have to bring a, a saw and then cut it and then you clean it and then you get wafer. And once you get the silicon wafers, you can build uh, your solar cells by doing more to that thing. You have to build the uh, electrodes. If you start with P type, then you have to build the N type silicon top of it. And then for optical management, you have to do a little bit of architectural thing on, on silicon uh, so that it absorbs, it, it, it's a slight absorption uh, efficiency goes up. Now, this is like the main uh, workers for, uh, for solar cell technology. Right from the 1956 till now, silicon is the king and has been the king. But we want to discuss this king. Because so, Abhitra, I think we should even we should say that even this, you know, it appears that the solar, the earlier slide, the solar cell grade is only 5.9 and not, you know, uh, but still, that's you. Even for a solar cell, you need ninety nine point nine 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 percent pure. That itself is fantastically pure. Of course, right. if you're making computer chips, you need ninety nine point nine 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 percent pure. True. That's that's yes. like you know unbelievably yes. pure. But yes. even yes. even solar cell silicon is not easy to make. True, very true. I completely agree with you, and that's where the most en energy consuming step of making silicon. So if you make any, so that's to give, uh, give an example, if you make a silicon solar cell and if you only you know, want to pay back in energy currency, like how much energy you have invested in, in, in silicon to make the silicon solar cell, it will take almost three to four years to get back that energy that was invested to make this thing, forget about other economics part. It's the energy part, it will take energy payback time is three to four years. So that is after four years, all your things, you can claim that it's green energy before that, Whatever energy that you have put in would, would, uh, has to be taken into account, right? So we want to, uh, this is the king of, of uh, solar cells, still the market leader, but there's so many other solar cell techniques are coming up. And as uh, Arno was mentioning, that it is like really, really, you know, you have to take really good care to make silicon uh, solar cell. And we are very lucky because the electronics industry expanded and that has fueled like kind of offshoot to uh, develop uh, solar cell. Whatever this r and is were in, uh, you know, developing silicon for electronics has helped for this uh, silicon technology uh, for solar cell applications. Now, we work on a different type of material and you will come to know that how it is different and how it is exciting. It is a, a big, it has a big family name. It's called perovskites, sounds Russian, right? Yes, it is named after a person called Leb Perovsky, it is a famous mineralogist and this mineral uh, calcium titanate type of mineral were uh, discovered in Russia. So all these things that are formed like calcium titanate or simply the form of ABX3, we call them perovskites. And we work on halide perovskites. Now the halide perovskites has three components, A, B, and X. A is a simple organic, it can be a simple organic cation 
or cation like you know cesium plus now b sites are a divalent metal ion like tin or lead and a sites are halide that's why we call it halide perovskite this could be iodide bromide uh, chloride okay fluoride we have not touched but generally these three halides are used now what is the beauty of this material you can take different combination of abx and then when you mix those things in different composition it gives semiconductor with different band gap i would know that the semiconductor is mainly defined by its band gap and it can span the full uh, visible range and beyond right so this is what is so fascinating about this thing because the one class of semiconductor you can make the band gap at will just by changing the composition of a b and x right now how the solar cell uh, uh, sorry perovskite solar cell looks like well it is a sandwich pretty much i'm i'm serious it's like sandwich but not the sandwich that you can eat but it's a sandwich of electronics materials so the perovskite is sandwich between two different type of materials and electrons now how do we prepare those things it's damn simple you take a lead salt and you take uh, organic salt it's damn very cheap salt, uh, uh, chemicals then you uh, take that in a beaker add some organic solvent that can dissolve these two and your perovskite formulation is ready now what you need to do is to make dosa i'll tell that how you make dosa you take and you put that uh, drip the solution onto a substrate you want to make something right then you just spin it so in dosa you spin something on top of to make it flat right so here we spin the substrate to make it flat and then you heat it and your your material is ready you can now compare this thing with the preparation of silicon uh, technology how much energy was invested there how clumsy that process was and here it is as simple as making dosa if you know your uh, materials right and you put it and that's why it has attracted the attention of the whole world and these materials are very cheap lead halides or organic salts this organic solvent you they are very cheap and the process is like this that what is the temperature i am using 100 to 150 degree centigrade but in silicon you 800 1000 degree centigrade you have to deal with those kind of temperatures for longer time and here you don't need to make a single crystal and cut it even they don't like if you make a single crystal and cut it they always like to be prepared in a thin film case right now how you prepare the perovskite uh, 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 by other ways well you can put that in a in a box and take uh, air out so you create a vacuum then you put your organic salt and lead salt you just heat it when they come and heat the substrate they will form so this is another way of making this uh, uh, perovskite uh, thin films and you can control the thickness the way you want right now how you make the total cell so basically you you start with a tco the transparent conducting uh, oxide glass is the same thing that is be used in uh, in mobile phone displays or any other displays the touch screens right and then you deposit your old, uh, uh, a transport layer so that is can be of organic or from oxide that you can do and then you deposit your perovskite the way you like right uh, and then you finish by uh, just evaporating the black metal contact is done and when it is done it is like this it is of the thickness of something around 0.7 micron you know that human hair is approximately 70 micron thick so it is 100 times less thicker or 100 uh, approximately uh, uh, 100 times less thick than the human hair and you can prepare this thin films just by using this simple spin coating spraying or evaporating you don't need any fancy things to get these very thin continuous thin films right and how it works it's very simple we have not used any pn junction because we don't know this is a very new technique we don't know how to do this perovskite it's a very active area of research we clearly don't know how to make a pn junction with uh, uh, with the perovskite what we do it it is like that we divided the job we say that okay the perovskite will absorb the light then there will be one guy that would take the holes out and there will be another guy that would take the electrons out this is what happens photon comes kicks the electron to the excited uh, state and then the electron can't go this direction you only come in this direction and the holes the counterpart of electron are called holes they are like bubbles they will come in the direction see just by putting two different layers you have given directionality 
is the simple like working like pn junction but there is no pn junction here is rather you can call it p this is a intrinsic sorry this is n this is a uh, intrinsic semiconductor and that's a p type that's how it works now what is the problem it's so exciting right we all gaga like but it has its problem what's the problem it's not stable i mean i mean at the beginning there was a joke and people are saying that my solar cell is very stable as long as you don't expose that to sun so that's what it is the stability of the solar cell used to be why because this fast generation things are very very uh, fragile they don't like uh, a little bit of moisture so the black form which generally absorbs a lot of light uh, goes to yellow form which is not a very good light absorber and the efficiency really goes down so we are at here but trying to make these things very stable trying to understand what can how can you make this stable so that it lives long and when it is uh, goes out it live long to give power for a longer amount of time in that regard we have a paper that come up in science in 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 the year 2020 what we showed that that you can see this formulation now it has gone really complex as i say that the abx3 i can take different compositions so here i have we have taken different compositions of the lead the organic cation and the halides that to that also i have added something it's added a very small amount and these small small things does very good chemistry at at a, a, to this material and makes it very stable and you see that without those uh, materials the stability goes really down over time but with this thing it has improved and if you just encapsulate and we have further studies that we have done that we can get like 3000 hours of stable perovskites in a oscillator state so we are getting close to there we are not there so most of our research are now understanding how these materials uh, behave uh, in in ambient conditions and how we can arrest uh, the degradation process in this material and come up with new type of material can it be combined with different kind of materials right the other aspects that we are working on is is how to improve the charge transport in this material like i i only talked about how to generate the charges and giving a directionality but if there is a too many you need to take them out nicely right if you can't take them thing then the efficiency will be less so people generally use a very expensive material to do that thing it's like 5 lakh rupees for one gram from tfr we come up with a very cheap uh, alternative to that and even works even better than this material so use a material called the dimethyl sulfoxide it is a very cheap organic solvent and this hydrobromic acid this is just and when you, this individually they don't do anything but when you bring these things together they start to increase the conductivity of the semiconducting materials used in this system not only that if it doesn't do anything there is a self destruction mechanism already built into that thing they will just destroy themselves and leave the matrix so they don't so but whereas this case they if they don't do anything they will stay there so that is actually becomes a liability for the material now this thing has got attention of media both national as well as international and we got our recognition saying that look here for researchers are making cheaper and efficient new generation solar cells right now we are also working on making new type of dopants so that we can make this existing class of material to work even better now we also trying to understand how to make this perovskite uh, 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 being doped because nobody knows how to do that in a controlled way we are trying to understand whether we can make a pn junction solar cell so that i don't i, I don't have to rely on another two layers that's a very active area of research the another thing that our group works on is called organic photovoltaics well it is nothing like your organic vegetables it is full of chemicals but it is because it is based on carbon based materials it can be purely carbon and hydrogen based material it could be a metal a small metal center with carbon and hydrogen it can have sulfur you know that the organics we generally use it you know this you do you recognize this color this is generally used to dye jean pants and this the pigment that's used is copper thalassinin and copper thalassinin is a very good organic semiconductor now what you can do is that we can take two different kind of organic semiconductor and you can mix them like in in a spaghetti and uh, uh, onions right you can mix those things and they can make what we call the bulk hydrogen cell solar cell and this is how we uh, prepare organic solar cells purely organic solar cells right so this is like 
different class of uh, 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 photovoltaic materials that we are currently working on. Now, what is the uh, role of this uh, extra thing that this organic or perovskite can do? They're super flexible, lightweight. You can think of these materials can be printed the way newspapers are printed. That will be lightweight. You can make it like rolls. You can go think of going on a camping and having a solar cell with you that could power during your camping set, right? Or you can think of you know, something that you can put that on a board or on your car top. It's so lightweight. So that's the application of flexible solar cells. Also, you can do it a building integrated photovoltaics. We also worked on that thing. That means in neutral color, that means you, I mean, uh, sometimes you use shades, right? Cottons, you don't want excess sunlight. But what you can do in studies like that, we can use solar cells as windows. And that will allow only a small fraction of light uh, whatever we needed in our house, but rest can be converted into electricity. And you can think of the now this high rise office buildings, they're full up like this structure, right? Glass structures. One could think of replacing all of those with, uh, with uh, this kind of uh, uh, semi-transparent uh, solar cells. And, and it will uh, do the dual job. It will uh, uh, restrict the, the direct uh, uh, sunlight uh, coming into uh, the office spaces and at the same time it will generate electricity, right? Now I've, I've talked about only organic and perovskite and silicon. That were in principle, there are um, I mean there are many other technologies of solar cell available. There's called the thin film technologies based on like cadmium telluride or copper indium uh, gallium sunlight CIGS cells. Uh, there are also uh, gallium arsenide cells. So so uh, people have been following the evolution of solar cells from 1975. And you can see that over the last five, six years, some of technologies has made very tremendous progress. If I'm to zoom in this area, we'll have a better look at it. Now you can see that this yellow dots, these are perovskites. And these are based on organic photovoltaics. And these are perovskites with silicon. I, I'll talk that why we need that thing, but if you look at it, uh, 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 different levels of uh, uh, solar cell fabrication, like something that we uh, prepare in the lab, we take utmost care. So that's what we call the lab cell or laboratory model or standard cell. So they always have the highest efficiency, but then you have to make modules. Means instead of one centimeter square area, you have to make, let's say one meter square area. That then the uh, efficiency goes down a little bit. But then the the industry has to prepare in a very large scale. So there the efficiency goes down further. So we see that if the technology gets really matured like silicon or gallium arsenide, the differences are not much. But the emerging class of solar cells like perovskites and uh, OPVs or lab cells are pretty much hitting like 25, 26, but the, the modules, we don't have a commercial thing yet, but the modules are uh, hovering around, let's say, below 15% efficiency or year around 10%. So that's where the research are again to be at the industrial scale. That we don't do. We only do the proof of concept, understand the basic physics. And now the industrial partners would again have to invest a lot of R&D to get into this. Uh, uh, because there was a question I'm answering it because there was a question that how we can make these panels more affordable. This is more like an industrial research. You have to do it and see that how we can uh, do it in a, in a reproducible way, right? Now, one could ask that one question that I say that the efficiencies are like, you know, never went below above 30%. The question is that why it can't be 100%? Whom should we blame? Because it's, it's not becoming 100%. We can blame the sun because sun is not monochromatic. You know that Isaac Newton first, uh, you know, say that like the sunlight, which appears white, is not white. It is a combination of different colors. He got a prism from a local pair, and then he put sunlight through it, and he saw the uh, seven colors, right? Now, if you look at carefully the sunlight, it's not only in the visible range. It has radiation uh, coming up uh, from different wavelengths, right? So this, uh, you can call it the, the, uh, the ultraviolet, the violet, uh, the red, and the infrared. They come in all different colors, right? And the energy content of this thing are very different. And because of this, uh, you know, physics, because sun you can think as a black body. Those who don't know, 
will uh, uh, you know when you go to the upper classes will know what that is because it's a black body it has a certain way the light uh, the electromagnetic radiation comes out of that thing so you see that there are typical things so they picked so this uh, 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 says that how many photons are coming and what is the energy right and because of that uh, the if you come up with a light uh, a photon which has lower than the energy of the band gap it will simply pass through uh, so but a quick question if you could just go yeah. back to the, the earlier one uh, i think many people must be wondering why it is not a you know a smooth uh, thing right there right little right. dips that keep coming yeah, in yeah yeah so this is the spectrum on earth and on earth you have water you have carbon dioxide you have all other diffraction so all these things contributes to this uh, spikes or the dips here if you go to outer space and you measure it it will be more like a perfect black body radiation bell shaped one you can actually take a, a black body at 6000 kelvin and it exactly matches the spectrum of sun uh, so but these dips are i know in infrared when you come to here uh, the water carbon dioxide start to absorb a lot and then you have cloud formation you have dust things get reflected so you see what you call the standard sun spectrum which pretty much like this and so in this a, you is know the sun spectrum on the earth's surface right so you lose a lot of the ultraviolet because of the ozone uh, thing you they don't you see a sharp drop in this region right they don't come uh, into our at much uh, to our surface which is good for us but not good for uh, solar cells because they lose few photons okay so if you come up with a lower uh, a photon with lower energy that will just pass through so that's a complete loss now if you come up with a higher energy this thing would thermalize very quickly to the respective edges right so that's a partial loss so in solar cell lot of loss, uh, loss are due to heat and because of and other thing is like that because of that peculiar shape the the efficiency to the band gap because semiconductor has a band gap it has a shape of like this so this is given by socklick weiser and if i put what how the solar cells are behaving Gallium arsenide and silicon are pretty close uh, to the theoretical limit. For all practical purposes, they have reached their practical limits. Perovskite, OPB, they have still a long way to cover if they want to compete with gallium arsenide. So that clearly, clearly tells us that a lot can be done in this uh, uh, area. Now, how we can go past this single junction uh, limitations? Well, uh, you have to make tandem. That means instead of using one of the semiconductor. We use two semiconductors. So one will capture the high voltage, uh, high uh, uh, the the photons with higher energy, and the with the lower uh, uh, band gap will capture the low uh, uh, energetic photons. Now silicon and perovskite makes a very good team, and people have already tried working on that one. Because as as I said that the silicon is the king, it's better not to fight with the king, rather to make a truce with the king. and see that whether we can make a truce and make uh, a mutually benefiting uh, uh, scenario so you can put uh, perovskite on silicon and then you can improve the efficiency even further and people have already worked on that thing and and many uh, industries such as oxford pv now they have reached the standard cell more than 29% efficiency which is way beyond all uh, kind of uh, Uh, single junction solar cells and people are hoping that they can uh, soon reach 33% efficient solar cells right so this technology silicon technology is there perovskite technology is getting to you know to a very um, uh, high level and now it's time to bring them together to even go further uh now a little bit of about economics when it is started in 1975 77 to produce one watt of uh, uh, solar power it used to cost around 76 dollars in 2050 it is it becomes like how much 30 cents now things are even further going down thanks to uh, uh, a lots of investment in uh, solar cell uh, research and production now to give a comparison you know in many places the coal and gas based one can be 4 to 5 us cents per kilowatt hour now in silica uh, if you have a good solar uh, uh, solar radiation you can get the power in less than 30 cents per kilowatt hour so that's how low it can be so the economics are on our side at least now 
the solar cell applications are enormous. I mean, it can help a tribal group of people, tribal people in, in certain remote area in Jharkhand to have access to electricity or to astronauts at, uh, in the International Space Station. So whenever there is no access to grid or conventional power sources, solar cell can be there. Now in India is making tremendous progress in, 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 in installing uh, uh, solar parks. Now you know that the, the biggest solar park in the world is in India. So this is in Rajasthan. So it has an area of 14,000 acres. And the installation that right now they're looking at is, it's close to uh, uh, 20, uh, 2200 megawatt. And you see that how the progress has happened from year uh, 2016 to 2020. So they're making tremendous progress. And uh, in India actually, the, the parts of Rajasthan, parts of Ladakh are the best place to put solar cells and, and because they get a uh, per like three, 30 days, they get uh, you know, sunlight uninterrupted. And, and particularly Ladakh and Leh, it is also a cold region and solar cells like uh, in the cold region. That's a, that's a uh, physics behind that, why they like it, right? So. Uh, I think it's quite amazing, right? I mean, uh, you know, we are used to, thermal power plants of 500 megawatts and things like this. Right. Right. This is, this is a solar park, a solar power plant, which is, you know, almost four times bigger than a typical thermal power station. Yeah. So Arnab, so there is a catch here and we have to understand. But this is, is yeah. Peak. So this is what this I was getting, peak, getting to. Right. <laughs> so this is what is called the peak hour thing. So this is what you get when there is a solar thing is at least the peak hour thing, but the, you don't get that thing when in the morning or in the evening. So the, Things are and it can be erratic when there is a cloud and other things. Those things also taken into account. But in a thermal power plant, it is uninterrupted things. It doesn't put a lot of load in the grid. So this will be a problem for the grid because all of a sudden there is a change in the power output. Then the grid has to adjust that. So one has to come with smart grids. So it has to be you know taken care of properly, or you have to have some mechanism where you can store the excess energy when it comes. And uh, unfortunately, the storage part is lagging a bit. We need more research on the storage so that whenever the solar cell produces more energy, we can store them or you can divert those things. So we need a good mix. So that's a good part about thermal or gas power because you can control the output and in, uh, uh, output power. Here you don't have. Whatever the sun decides, you have to deal with that. Thing. So if you know that thing and with a very good uh, weather forecasting, I think a smart grid can be thought up and, and both both can be together. So only solar cell can't be reliable. So that's actually a bottleneck of, of application of solar cells. Uh, it may not provide you energy when you need. It just provide whenever the sun is out and you may not need it at that time, right? And, and, and this is particularly the problem in Europe because in the night they need uh, a lot of energy to warm their houses, but the sun is not there and particularly in winter that's not there particularly in the country like in the UK, in the winter, you hardly see the sun, but that's the time where you need the most consumption of uh, energy to, to, to heat your room. So basically this is a supply and demand side. So you have to just balance. But in India, we are a pretty good place to, to harvest solar cell, uh, solar energy, and then distribute things. And you have a right mix actually. And as I say that uh, 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 we need to move to a sunny side. I want to, uh, end my talk by showing a, a, a painting uh, by a four-year kid, uh, what C means by going to the sunny side, uh, going with your father and, 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 and talking to a talking tree. So that's what uh, we should leave behind for our future generation. If you could invest a lot on solar cell research, then you can get a very good uh, or a better world for the future generation. With this, I end my talk. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, guys. Uh Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, Pavitra, for taking us into this world of uh, solar cells. Uh, I think we have a mix of questions and uh, both on, on Zoom and on YouTube, certainly, maybe Facebook as well. Dibya, if there are questions on Facebook, please just paste them in the chat. Uh, okay, so uh, let's start at the very beginning. Uh, are you okay to take some questions, right? Yeah, 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 please. Yeah. I, I love to interact too. Okay, so... Uh, uh, maybe I think uh, you probably went through this a little quickly. What is the property of silicon which makes it a preferred material for a photon energy capture or preferred material for solar cells? 
Well, okay. to be very honest, it is not. It is an indirect semiconductor band gap. That means you need a much thicker silicon to absorb. So silicon, because it was available, people started to work on it. It's not the best material for solar cell research. Uh, so if I can go back to my uh, slide of Sakli Kwaisa thing, the silicon thing is here, the 1.1 band gap. So the best is gallium arsenic. It is more because people have invested a lot uh, in in, uh, in uh, semiconductor research, and you could make silicon uh, in a much uh, uh, what do you call it, reproducible way. So this is the most most available technology uh, technique. So that's why it is people have started using it. But this is not the best. So now it is again how much investment you have already made into uh, silicon, uh, and 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 and. Uh, and that's what actually driven this economics of these things. But if you look at the other technologies that has emerged, that's why people started to move to uh, try to find out different technology. If silicon was the best, people would have stopped working on, on solar cells. Uh, it is not the best. Uh, but yes, the, like any other semiconductor properties, it has the properties that is uh, suitable for uh, solar cell application, particularly it can absorb a uh, huge amount of uh, uh, solar radiation because of band gap. And you can make it uh, still manage to, uh, you know, get if you get it thick. Uh, the other thing that I can think of is uh, is like that the polycrystalline silicon. You don't have to get the pure single crystalline silicon to do that. Thing. Polycrystalline is much easier to make and uh, it's less expensive. Uh, you can make that thing. That's also another reason that can do that thing. Uh, but then you can take the example of amorphous silicon. People wanted to get into amorphous silicon, but that never kicked up. It just, you know, plateaued around 10% efficiency. Now this is a dead technology. So maybe I think the answer in short is, uh, well, silicon is an okay material, not the best material, right. but because of the electronics industry, there is just so much infrastructure Investment. in making silicon right. that we can make, you know, football field size of amount of wafers right. uh, every year. And hence, you know, there's a lot of like the industry has picked it up right. and there right. are economies of scale the which economy, the other the materials of scale has. don't have. And hence, it is the most popular uh, material today. Uh, and other thing, other thing I forgot to mention is the durability. So silicons are very durable. It's like close to 20 to 25 years. So other technologies are not proven to be that uh, much durable. So another thing, good thing about silicon. Oh, so that's also another, like the people's perception that when you buy things, it should last long. So the silicon okay. solar cell lasts long. So that's another thing what can favor of silicon. Yeah, so you, I mean, silicon solar cells are at a point <laughs> where even though it takes a lot of energy to make silicon, but the cell will last for 20 years. So it's okay right. if the first three years go and right. repay right. the energy right. cost, right. it will last for 20 right. years. Okay. Right. Right. Uh, all right. So there are two questions on you. You showed the, the, the space cell mm. and uh, uh, <laughs> I know the answer to one of them at least. Uh, how do the solar cell efficiencies change in space as compared to the Earth's surface? And uh -huh. uh, do the ISS solar cells specifically tap the UV region, which is missing on Earth? The answer is yes, because when you go to outer space, all of a sudden your solar intensity becomes 1.3 times higher than what you get on the Earth's surface. So all of a sudden you start to get the improvement in the current. Now, as far as the voltage is concerned, it is determined by the band gap of the solar cell, not the radiation generally you put on that thing. So you might be harvest a bit of this uh, UV pad, but it, the, the amount of uh, photons that comes in the UV region is very small because of, again, the Planck's black body radiation. If you compare that to this visible region, uh, something let's say around uh, green region, uh, it will be really like orders of magnitude less or two orders of magnitude less. So generally you don't gain as much there, but you gain in terms of the Filtering effect is not there. You start to gain more uh, there. Yes, the answer is you gain some in current. Yeah, well, maybe, I mean, given that this is a material I'm familiar with, uh, for space, actually, the, the solar cells are optimized for their weight because it's very important. It's very, very expensive to take things right. up to space. So these are typically what are called uh, multi-junction solar cells using a different material, gallium arsenide, uh, or gallium indium phosphide. Those are what yeah. I use for space cells. And those are, of course, I mean, today they are almost, of course, they're not one cell. They're, you know, multiple, multiple cells put on top of yes, each other. Tandem, as, yes. as Pabitra said, they're almost 40% efficient. And uh, uh, the main thing is they're extremely low weight. 
uh, but they are so expensive that you would never yeah. use them on on earth uh, it's it's too expensive it's okay for space uh, and yes they will of course tap the uv uh, let's go back to let's just let's uh, jump to youtube for for a bit uh, and uh, uh, let's see so now there are there are questions on the your perovskite solar cells especially the uh, degradation part of it uh, mm -hmm. so uh, so india science theater is asking about the degradation of the solar cell is it because of exposure to air or is it because of the water vapor in the air or is it because of the light itself that is coming so uh, you know if you if it was only because of the air can you cap it with something and uh, will it then survive or is it also the light that makes it go bad okay the that is intrinsically there is no problem with this material uh, they are very stable the extrinsic factor that you talked about light water and oxygen so the all the three is come together to do the damage now the oxygen alone can't do anything if there is no light but we need light to be there because it's a solar cell application so you are right if you could make a nice encapsulation that prevents the ingress of oxygen and water the light alone can't do anything even if it does something this material has the property called the self healing if it does something they will heal themselves so that is no problem in if there is any damage that uh, is caused by light alone it is actually light followed by the reaction that it does with oxygen and water so if you stop ingress of oxygen and water by nice sealing then uh, the longevity of uh, this solar cells improve okay and uh, so uh, soumya Sundar Palui is asking in perovskite solar cell degradation issues. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Okay, what should we keep in our mind to fix those problems at room temperature? So, is there is there a I mean, is there a problem because the solar cell heats up when sun shines, uh, sunlight falls on it? Is that what causes degradation? Temperature? Or do you uh, have to cool? I mean, if you could cool the solar cell and maintain it at room temperature. Well, there is a heat induced, but that generally happens when if these materials undergoes phase changes. now particularly solar cells perovskite solar cell a bit happy with being at a higher temperature because some of this phase are more stable at slightly higher temperature than at room temperature which is the other the case in uh, other materials other materials like to be you know more stable at uh, low temperatures so the perovskites uh, room temperature i mean you don't need to do anything special other than uh, encapsulating it it better way so just by lowering the temperature might do harm because they might undergo some sort of phase change which may not be good uh, so just you know encapsulating these things at room temperature is fine letting beating of heating of is fine 50 degrees is degree centigrade if the cell temperature goes you lose a little bit of voltage efficiency but uh, stability wise it's not going to do any harm but yes going beyond 100 degrees going to problem because if you have lots of organic they start to leave so okay uh there is another question on uh, uh there was an idea of installing solar panels on rivers uh, mm -hmm. it keeps them uh, it prevents evaporation of water and keeps the temperature low is this still happening well uh, not on the rivers uh, but mostly on canals uh, in gujarat they have tried uh, many places they have tried uh, it was like a pilot project uh, it was done for some time but i think people have found that there are other better places to put and get uh, maximum benefit of uh, of solar cell uh, um, solar power generation rather than putting that on on canals but yes the few places uh, i think in gujarat they have tried but it's not uh, like a widely used uh, kind of um, thing in india few places they have done it but uh, they think there are other places they could do better okay so uh, um, let me go back there is there is a question both from manmeet on uh, zoom and uh, somebody user entropy bucket in uh, youtube uh, comparing solar cells with plants and uh, whether you can use chlorophyll uh, the technology used in plants to generate uh, thing of course you can't generate electricity but from an energy conversion pr perspective uh, how does it compare with uh, uh, photovoltaics and solar cells well they are very poor i mean this is a misconception and uh, that uh, this photosynthesis is the best way to do that thing that's 
that's a evolution process so it has been meant to do a particular kind of chemical reaction so the efficiency is for that particular kind of chemical reactions to do that thing for for direct solar light to energy conversion i think this way is better than and this thing and the efficiencies are far low if you look at only at the uh, the energy conversion uh, efficiencies this is not uh, comparable in, in terms of these things the yes, photosynthesis way below photosynthesis is not if you look at the energy the total yes. solar energy yeah, coming yeah, in yeah. and the yeah. energy of the uh, glucose or whatever produced yeah. it's actually yeah. not very efficient but photosynthesis yeah. is designed for completely different, different. things it's for, not for designed to make electricity biology. anyway yes so it, it is done to do biology so it is doing yeah. its job better there. Okay, uh, there are a few technical questions on the perovskites, which I will come to in a bit. Um, and uh, but before that, let me just see if there are some general questions still remaining. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. Okay, let me go back to uh, to the Zoom window. Okay, let's let's go out to some more questions. Are a little bit technical. Uh, there is one on Facebook from Shriparna. Uh, who is asking do you think water repelling water repelling etl or htl will reduce degradation of the perovskite layer or will it generate some other issues so sipanna thank you very much i know you are from imt and you are asking this question uh, so uh, yes uh, that would improve and uh, water repelling uh, uh, electron transport layer is is definitely uh, uh, people have uh, you know a solution people have tried actually uh, these things but the problem is like that when you make things really hydrophobic unless to overcome that thing then the what we have seen is like that the stability improves yes but it's some some sort of you know technical barrier one has to overcome just by putting the layers together okay uh, there is a very quick uh, follow up to the photosynthesis question has anybody done photosynthesis in vitro um, i think the answer is yes right a lot of people who study photosystem 2 and mm -hmm. things like that uh, uh, even in in probably in tfr uh, okay uh, a question on uh, a question on on again stability uh, this is being asked by vvn ravi kishore uh, mm -hmm. uh, how does bmp and something increase the stability of the solar cell is the mechanism understood bmp bmp plus bf4 does that make sense oh yes makes sense so you just asked my question regarding so, so uh, thank you ravi ji for this question it's a very intriguing question that how this uh, ionic liquid that you have added this uh, quaternary ammonium salt right that's the question if you understand correctly the bf4 minus and the quaternary ammonium salt how it improves the stability of the uh, perovskite yes we actually looked at it that how it improves the stability when we did solid state nmr again it's a technical answer my apologies to our general audience so because it's a technical question i have given you a technical answer to that so basically when you do solid state nmr of, of this material what we find is like that these salts are staying at the grain boundaries of this material and we know that all this degradation starts at the grain boundary and then it progresses so because these salts are at the grain boundaries it actually stops this initial reaction which happens with oxygen so it stops there and that's why the cell becomes more stable uh okay so uh again there is a there are two related questions more general questions uh one from pranav who is asking this in zoom and ashish 19 is asking something similar in in uh, uh the the youtube uh so Uh, Pranav says, "Why don't you have solar cells installed on mobile phones uh, or something which can use solar energy in the real time and then switch back to some other thing when sun is not available?" He's curious about that. And Ashish says, "These solar cells which you put on top of a vehicle, is it really worth it? Uh, is it of any use to have a solar cell roof, or is the energy produced not enough?" I mean, both the cases, the energy produced is not enough. You only see that how much radiation you are getting and how much power you would generate at a given point of time, and whether that's sufficient to run a cell phone or to run a car. Uh, thing. Uh, my answer is no. You need to. What you can do is like a backup. Like it can charge your batteries uh, for some time, and that could be like a supplement. On its own, it's not going to be sufficient. 
to do that thing. So basically, yes, one could think of like a backup. People have now instead of having the cell phone, they have like backpacks with with flexible solar cells. So when you are going out, that can use just you know power up your uh, uh, cell phones for some time. So that is possible. But uh, just having a small uh, uh, piece of solar cell on a cell phone, I think the power is not sufficient. And and all the time you will be in the sun to do uh, to you know use your cell phone. So that's not a good idea. Also for the indoor applications, solar cell you don't have to worry about that thing. Uh, mobile phone is mostly like an indoor thing, and car yes, but I I don't think the the power that would generate would be sufficient to drive a car. But yes, it can always supplement. And a little bit of addition means if a reduction in the carbon dioxide uh, emission. That's always good. Even this little little things help. Okay. Um, uh, there is one question from uh, a use, uh, anonymous user saying that uh, your uh, perovskite solar cells do they have lead in it, and is that a problem? Because we know that lead acid batteries have a big problem in their disposal because of the pollution caused by lead. That's a very valid question, and uh, we get hounded by this question many, many times. Yes, the answer is yes. It has lead. But you have to put this thing in context. Like, how much lead is in there? Like, if you took, uh, take this whole solar cell, the weight, it will be even less than one percent of the weight that lead is there. Now, the second thing is that how much, uh, if you use, let's say, uh, lead-based perovskite in solar cell generation, how much of uh, you know coal mining you have stopped? Because coal mining and coal power gas stations produce a lot of uh, lead emission to the uh, environment, right? So you produce actually more lead in that way rather than using the lead in the solar cell. Now the third part is that the lead is really a problem when it gets to the food cycle or or it contaminates the soil. So what we have done these kind of calculations and we have found that the amount of already lead present in the ambient condition, if you take this really worst case scenario, things break, you know, one meter square thing, how much you know things would improve? It's really really minuscule. Because the amount of lead being used is really small. And you know that we have also solution for that thing. I was talking to a biologist as NCBS. You know this mustard plants. They are very good at absorbing these heavy metals. So you can have some lead contamination. You can pour that thing and get it out of the soil. So as long as you know where your lead is and you have the checks uh, uh, or the places, then uh, it is like you know somebody could argue like that, look, look nuclear power plants. They're so bad because how, what do you do with the nuclear waste? What happens there is, a, there is an accident. So there's always a backup things, but if you always have to this risk and the benefit. So I would say that the benefit that we get from perovskite solar cells, it completely outweighs the risk that is possessed by having little bit of lead into it. And because of the same reason, European Union, which is very strict about the lead usage in electronics has extempted the solar cells from use of lead. So, so yes, I mean, it is not the label that we should be worried about. Okay. Um, back to, let's see if there are more questions coming in here. Where is the chat? I lost my chat. Ah, there we are. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, there is a question on actually a competing technology, which is solar thermal. So if you use arrays of mirrors to heat up a certain liquid using sunlight and create energy from it, uh, how does this compare to the efficiencies of solar cells, etc.? So somebody wants to compare solar thermal with. Yeah, there is a lot of research uh, has been you know going on this solar thermal using uh, mirrors uh, using you know concentrating that onto a tower and then using molten salts. That's another research uh, They are Again, every technology is developing. So they are progressing that way. But I, if I understand correctly, they still lacks uh, the efficiency uh, from, uh, that you get from solar cells. Uh, so it is actually a race between technologies. So I think the solar uh, cell technology is far higher than this solar thermal. That's why you see a lot of investment in this thing. Now, uh, a solar uh, cell has another thing is like that, uh, you can have like small, small instrument and still you can generate these things. But the solar thermal need a big place and, and uh, do all these things. Uh, and also this other thing, other problem with uh, this uh, solar thermal is like the tracking. You need to have this uh, mirrors to track the sun to that thing. So there is a tracking problem there in, in 
you uh, know general solar cells you can have a peak angle and still produce enough uh, energy so that's i think things is two different between solar thermal and uh, uh, solar cell technology but in its own right solar thermal is a very good technology and people have been trying to improve that technique technology also also i think the main motivation for solar thermal is that if you melt the salt in the day you can store it uh, you can store, you can store the it. energy in latent heat and then use the molten salt that's at night to continue that's your uh, thing but mm-hmm. i think i still think these Thanks. are small demonstrations uh, which yeah. are not really at a commercial scale yeah. as of yeah. now uh, okay there seems to be another very general question about uh uh okay this is uh we've taken that uh how does the sun look from space does the because the atmosphere goes is it going to look very different or it's going to look almost the same so arnab i deflect this question to you please <laughs> it, it's all all you're doing is you saw the spectrum yeah right? i think i think it's still it's the same slide is being shared you're just removing those small dips so it's not changing the overall yeah. spectrum very yeah. much i think even from sun we've seen i think we've seen pictures taken from uh, the space station and all i think the sun looks still pretty much yellowish uh, those little little dips due to your water absorption yeah. or you know yeah. uh, see That's anyway the, black body. the uv goes away it doesn't matter because we don't see the uv anyway and in the visible the lines the small lines uh, though that absorption doesn't change the overall color of the sun from space uh, very much at all okay uh, any other question that's uh okay there is another one is solar energy the only one that does not use a turbine to generate electricity uh, uh and is that the reason for it being inefficient uh no i think there are actually many i mean uh there are many technologies that will will i mean are there other new that don't use a turbine yeah like the one is like this uh, you know thermoelectrics so that generate electricity from heat so they don't need uh, is you know turbines to produce uh, electricity so you don't need actually uh, what else i could think of similarly i think wave energy uh, they just use yeah yeah plug but that there you also need uh, mechanical things so when there is yeah. a mechanical things in you need a mechanical need converter right. yes yeah so but here uh, solar uh, like uh, uh, the when they use heat or light as a source of energy then you don't need the turbine uh, is like, is uh, the lack the, the more interesting question is a follow up question to this he has a second question saying is the lack of the turbine the reason for the efficiency being limited to 30 odd percent uh yeah i mean the physics data means that thing like the physics says that how much you can uh, convert because the sun is at one t- room temperature you are uh, uh, you know operating your solar cell at uh, uh, non zero uh, kelvin temperature so and sun is far away from us all this physics i mean the physics data means that how much conversion should happen if you are going this way if there is a mechanical way i mean what is your form of energy if somebody would say that i take the sun uh, you know evaporate water and then how much it comes out and then use the turbine this is a different uh, ball and game to you know uh, to to compare with. i think it will be unfair to compare this thing it's comparing apples and oranges because once where you are converting mechanical energy converting one mechanical form to another one and then converting that to electricity where this is things are very straight forward but here it has lot of uh, other physics takes care uh, takes place and uh, uh, and the reason as we mentioned that the sun is not monochromatic and if in principle let's put this way if you could manage to get really you know infinitely stacked uh, semiconductors you can get up to 66% efficient uh, so are you going to do that thing right and if you take all the temperature and other thing into out of equation you can go to like 85% efficiency so this is all about how you want to play the game right so this is not because of the turbine because the kind of physics have been you know involved there uh, in the energy conversion and the material we use okay uh, there is a question saying that why don't we charge batteries with the sun in, uh, in with the solar cell basically in the day and uh, use that at night oh people do that thing and in, in all of this uh, uh, off grid connections have actually a battery that uh, being charged in the daytime and there is an inverter that converts back and uh, supplies the light in the uh, uh, light in the night time so basically so no but even, so 
even you're saying even the the solar power plants they actually no 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 solar power plants more yeah so for solar power energy. plants can you can you charge something in the can you sort of store the store part of the yeah, energy no. in the day and you know no i i answered this question before that our storage has not evolved to store that thing so what one could think of doing is like that you have a reservoir nearby you pump water to the reservoir uh, and then in the night time again you use the turbine to generate so the losses would be huge and that's how you can store uh but uh, having a you know large scale storage is still people are working on that thing there is called a redox flow batteries people are working on thing or you know uh, the molten salt reservoir people are trying different techniques so that they could actually uh, um, store the energy uh, generated in the daytime by the big solar parks but, yeah, but mostly I, now they are grid connected yeah i think the and answer to the batteries question is that i think the the battery efficiency is actually very very uh, still where a lot of work needs to be done right uh, and uh, so even now it's probably more efficient to just pump water up and uh, use right. it right. use hydropower at night as as pavitra said okay there is a question directly on your perovskites uh, can you use instead of rapid thermal annealing can you use laser annealing for your synthesis you means i have laser yes that's possible people are demonstrated yes it's possible okay a uh, good question is can you you know instead of instead of uh, sunlight to electricity and then electricity to charging your battery uh, can you recharge your battery directly from the sun yes it is possible and we are currently working in that aspect also it's called uh, photo rechargeable batteries it is little bit uh, complex because the amount of uh, because in batteries you need a huge potential difference right like close to 3 volt or uh, 3.5 volt that's the state of that lithium based batteries that are working on so getting it that voltage directly from sunlight using a single junction uh, uh, single band gap material is uh, uh, is not possible thermodynamics doesn't allow that thing. so you have to go into a kind of tandem junction to do that thing and currently with my colleague uh, professor tn narayan actually we actually got a uh, infosys leading grant uh, to work particularly on this aspect that how we can directly convert uh, sunlight into uh, and that store that in the same device so we are on to that it's very challenge it's, it's, it's doable but the efficiencies are really really low we are working on that okay so i think uh, somebody asked what are the frontiers in solar energy and i think you just answered it uh, uh, making a solar battery where you directly have sunlight and can cause a chemical re- reaction in the battery to store your energy that would be i think right. the frontier and i think yeah i see no no we don't have any question okay so uh that then brings us to the end of the session i don't see any more questions uh so looks like certainly solar cells have a bright future uh, but of course there is lots and lots of work that we need to do to tackle both issues which come from basic physics all the way to issues in manufacturing and making them uh, available on a large scale and finally of course as uh, pavitra said it's all economics because you have to sell the power at a at a cost uh, which is uh, cheap enough Uh, that uh, you know the cost of installing the solar cells the cost of the power everything that's finally economics depends de- defines whether something will be used or not but today it looks like solar cells have actually broken that barrier uh, they they are the the power up is actually much cheaper than that produced by nuclear or 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 thermal and other th- uh, power plants so on that note uh, thank you very much for watching uh, thank you pavitra for taking your time on a sunday morning to tell us all about uh, solar cells um Uh, for those who have been surendra can i ask you to k- turn your camera on please um uh, so we will of course be back two weeks from now uh with another episode of uh, chai and why um uh, surendra if you're listening can you turn your camera on it would be great uh, so uh, this is for those who have been following chai and why for the last 13 years that we have been operating um it's been a you know there's one person who's been behind the scenes and has been really really instrumental in ensuring that all these sessions were held both at prithvi theater ruparel college uh, alexandra school and wherever we've gone and that is surendra kulkarni those who have uh, seen him uh, may have uh, may have come to our sessions and would have definitely seen him 
And this is actually Surendra's last Chai and Y. He's going to be super animating from TIFR at the end of the month. Uh, Surendra, thank you so much for all your contributions over all these years in getting the show going. It's been great to have you on. And uh, don't worry, Chai and Y will still continue. And I think Surendra will help us and volunteer and help keep keep helping us because uh, you know it gets addictive once you get to Chai and Y. We've we've not missed a session in 13 years, and we don't intend to miss one in the near future anyway. So yeah. on that note, keep following us. Uh, we are at Chai and Y on Twitter, uh, Facebook. Uh, you can send an email to outreach o u t r e a c h at t i f r dot r e s dot i n to be added to the mailing list. And uh, hope to see you again, uh, certainly online. And if they allow us, we are very eager to go back to our physical sessions as well. So on that note, thanks a lot, everyone. See you again in two weeks. Bye-bye for now. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for giving this platform and this wonderful audience. Uh, I think you have a lot of interaction you have. And uh, wish you all the best, Kulkarniji. Uh, Thank you so very much. I hope we'll meet, we'll meet in person Hiya. soon. Yes, yes, sure. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Okay.